podcast viewers, welcome to EMS at Sea Level. Today's guest is Nicole Russo from Microboard. Nicole, thanks so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure to chat to you on the Eric Miskell show, I think maybe two months ago now, time's flown by. Um, and we were talking a lot about disruption there, and we just seem to go from one disruption to another. Uh, and I want to get into that. But first of all, just give us a quick introduction to Microboard and, and give me a feel for what makes you different to a lot of other EMS um, companies out there. Sure. So, hi, Phil. Thank you so much for having uh, us here at Microboard and I, the ability for me to present uh, our family owned business. We've been here in Connecticut for 40 years. Uh, so we are a leading edge uh, EMS, uh, what we consider ourselves a tier one by all of our capabilities, uh, although by the numbers, you know, we've got 140 employees with one site. So we're, we're a bit mm -hmm. smaller, obviously, than some of our big competitors. Um, but really what makes us different is our ability to go to market and build some of the most advanced technology uh, in a very uh, quick time to market for our customers. Uh, including really strong supply chain relationships and, and robust uh, supply chain strategies, which have become that much more important in today's age. Uh, we have a, a who's who's list of customers that include actually less than 20 customers. And we do that on purpose to keep our service up, as well as uh, most of our equipment in the building is uh, less than three to four years old. So we've, we've got a really advanced technological mm. roadmap for uh, what we're putting into the building for our customers okay um fascinated by your by your customer account which has got to be one of the one of the lowest do you deliberately maintain a low number and do you have a strategy where you actually you know almost interview customers to make sure they're a good fit for you what are, what's your what's your focus there on driving that number yeah, so excellent question. So we've come uh, from the thought process of we're not chasing revenue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's easy to do. And we could bring many customers on board that would essentially uh, maybe drown us in, um, you know, too many tactical things in our service levels would essentially not be able to sustain where we want the business to be. So we do interview our customers. Uh, we do mm -hmm. have what we call the three C's, uh, credit, culture, and complexity. Uh, a customer, first of all, has to be able to pay their bills. Uh, credit's extremely important. Uh, then is it a complex uh, either product or supply chain? Uh, and either or are really what drive the backbone of how we operate. Uh, and then um, culturally, do we align? You know, can we work with their team? We want to work with people that we enjoy uh, you know, working alongside. So those three, uh, we do turn away more customers than we take. And I say that very humbly, uh, mm. but we do it on purpose. Uh, we try to bring in anywhere from one to two new good solid customers a year and no more than that. Um, and then, of course, uh, we try to grow our existing customers, and we've done very well at growth with our existing customers over the last uh, five years. Okay. And you talk about cultural fit, which I think is is incredibly important and um, really pleased to hear that. But what, is, what does that look like when you look at the culture of, um, of an EMS company, the culture of the industry? I think we're seeing a bit of a reinvention at the moment, particularly when I talk to companies in in Europe as we shift away from this slightly adversarial relationship to something that's much more an in-depth partnership from design all the way through product life cycle. Do you see that as part of your, as part of your culture or is there more, more to it? Yeah, I think for us, um, we want to be able to work with a customer that understands the challenges that um, we're both up against and partners in a way that neither of us are throwing something back over the wall at each other. Um, you know, we have to stand firm in the solutions together. Um, so whether it's a brand new product that's trying to get to market quickly, um, that has not been built before, uh, or if it's a you know, a sustaining product uh, that's being moved to us for other reasons. Uh, our ability to understand uh, what the pitfalls are, you know, and, and no, no products uh, easy, especially in this environment, mm. um, and really be able to dialogue openly with our customer on the challenges and the solutions um, is really critical, whether again, it's a new product or a, a sustaining product. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that makes, 
you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. And we talked a bit earlier about disruption. The that level of partnership, that level of openness is even more important, I guess, when we're in a, a disruptive environment. It is, you know, and I, and especially with this supply chain, we don't expect uh, in this type of environment to, uh, you know, call a customer and say, sorry, can't get the parts. We also don't expect the customer to say to us, you're on your own go figure mm. out how to get the parts. So there really does have to be some dialogue. Um, you know, we're all having a common goal. It's their bill of material, they've chosen it. Um, you know, we are providing other solutions of alternates when we can. If there aren't uh, alternate options, then we're gonna ask that customer to help us, you know, dig in where we, we need to together. Um, yeah. So it's really critical. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of the strap line of that whole thing is you're never on your own. Yeah, and and you can't afford to be because it is it is complex and it does need a um, you know pressure at all ends of the supply chain to fix some of these problems we're in at the moment. Typically, what industries are your are your customers um, focused on? You you talked about complexity. Of, if that's a, a big part of it, there are some obvious sectors. But talk me through the kind of um, industry mix that you service. Sure. So we are uh, servicing the military, medical, industrial, and telecom sectors. Uh, mm -hmm. Military really is a cornerstone of our business for over 20 years now. Um, most recently, uh, quite a number of flex and rigid flex circuitries. Uh, where we've done uh, a lot of different uh, radar systems, uh, the communication system for the Pentagon. Uh, these are mm -hmm. these are publicly announced, and in many cases, we've gotten awards for many of these products. Uh, we're also building defibrillators here, uh, 3,000 a month, as well as the batteries that go into those full box build integration, mm -hmm. uh, gas handheld detectors, uh, the only indoor shot detection system built in the country. I actually was hosting uh, our local police department today because uh, we're going to put it in our building. We have no threat mm -hmm. against our building, but we build it. And, uh, you know, we see that as a, a security solution for the environment we live in these days. Uh, so that's the uh, the gamut of the different sectors we work in. Mm. Yeah. OK, interesting stuff. And, and yeah, clearly stuff that does have a, a high degree of complexity. I just wanted to get back to the, the topic of disruption and you know, I think when we look over the, the past, I don't know, maybe three or four years, you know, before the pandemic, we were we were concerned with um, trade wars with China, and that was uh, having an impact on the industry and on the supply chain. Then we go into the pandemic, we come out of the pandemic, we're straight into component shortages. Um, at the moment, we seem to be threatened by economic storm, shall we say. Uh, on the horizon, we you know we can't say for certain that's the next next disruption, but it just seems to be one after another. Is that how you see it? And do you feel your business was ready for this state of almost permanent disruption, or have you had to make changes? Yeah, really good question. I, I'll separate those into uh, what I would say is the tactical day to day versus mm. the strategic, including capital structure. Uh, so, you know, so I think any business with a strong capital structure and or a strong banking relationship uh, will be able to weather that. And that includes us. Uh, we're primarily a debt-free company. My mm -hmm. experience prior to coming back to run this business was I was a senior vice president at GE Capital in distressed debt. Uh, so I know what not to do uh, in business. I learned uh, yeah. some lessons for about seven years. Uh, so I foresee the, um, the capital structure side of the business and our customers and our suppliers um, weathering this, uh, you know, if, if they've got the strength of those relationships. Um, companies that don't or can't foresee, you know, their way through this will definitely struggle as they're waiting to relieve their inventory positions and, and they're mm. kind of caught up. Um, on the tactical day to day, you know, it is brutal. I mean, this year for us is much harder than 2020 and 21, you know, when COVID was really ramping and we were all afraid of, you know, our health concerns. Uh, I don't think we ever really projected that we'd have this backlash of supply chain challenges, this much of, in workforce challenges. Uh, mm. You know, I am starting to see some local companies here in Connecticut, uh, large companies actually, that are starting to reduce force slightly. Right. And I think there's a backlash a little bit with the consumer spending. Uh, so hopefully that workforce uh, issue is going to relieve itself a little bit. 
Um, but the supply chain strategies are going to continue, we know, through at least the end of next year, 2023, and even into 2024. Um, so it's, it's, it's very tough. We are trying to employ new strategies um, in how we go about securing inventory um, over what time periods, uh, you know, how we're expediting different tools and automation we're trying to use uh, to, to really combat that. Yeah, I mean, it's shortages, shortages everywhere, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, if it's, if it's not component, it's, um, it's talent shortages. Are you able to, I know, you know, when I look at your business and I look at the complexity um, and the security there, you'd think it would be easier for you than some people to um, attract talent. Is that, is that something you mentioned that you felt that might be easing as some people were were reducing their their team size. Are you seeing improvement there? Do you find it easy enough to um, recruit talent? So I, I'd separate our labor force into uh, our assembly and then our kind of mm. our, more of our staff. Um, on the assembly side, it's been it's picked up in its ease uh, over the last three to four months. We've actually hired mm -hmm. about fifteen on the assembly side over the last, which is you know about a ten percent growth in our workforce. Uh, on the staffing, when you're talking engineers, uh, supply chain, program managers, that still remains very difficult. Uh, you know, I think there, I'll be transparent, we do not have a work from home strategy right now. Um, I have talked to many manufacturing companies who have tried it and it's really backfired, uh, mostly because of us versus them. The buyers can yeah. work at home, but the engineers can't. So we've decided not to embrace it at this point. Um, I could be making a mistake, I'll tell you, but um, I feel like it's the fair thing to do in the business and we need everybody here. We're manufacturing products every day. So we are missing out on a couple employee opportunities with some people that are just really wanting to stay at home. Um, yeah. And I you know, can't run the business that way. So yeah. Yeah, no, it's a big challenge. And I think it's a really interesting situation. And what you don't want is division within the cup within the company that right. becomes um, that becomes super dangerous within the organization and within the staff. What is, what's the kind of diversity mix look like at the moment? Uh, as far as DEI? Of, uh... Yeah. Yeah, so we're uh, we're very diverse here across multiple uh, ethnic uh, and languages. Um, we've got a number of um, women in our engineering group as well as our purchasing group, um, program management staff. So um, that is not a metric that we've ever struggled with here. Um, okay. And I'm really proud of that. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can be a little daunting. Like right now, we're actually teaching ESL, English as a second language, because as mm -hmm. we're growing the business, you know, it's a necessity, um, but it's allowing us the diversity. Um, so but we've always had a strong metric there. Yeah. And is that is that through all, the whole organization, you know, female owned, female managed um, company it is. You, you've managed to maintain that diversity all the way up the uh, up to board level uh, we have yes actually on our website um, you'll see we have three board advisors uh, two men and a, a very talented women all of them very talented um, in my executive staff we've got a re nice ratio of men to women um, and I have to tell you I don't think we ever planned it that way we've always put the mm. best people in the jobs um, but it's just really worked out uh, that way and you know we're really proud of that uh, yeah. we also we also have a tendency to attract um, talent here based on uh, the humanitarian mission we embrace, which is uh, we build, we like to say we build the most advanced technology in the world while helping those least fortunate. Uh, so we partner with nine NGO organizations around the world where people mm -hmm. are desperate for water, medical, education, food. They're making less than a dollar a day. Um, and that's a real cornerstone of our business. We've been doing that for 40 years. That's not a wow. new check the box social, you know. Um, so I think some of the talent we've been able to attract here has been drawn just based on their ability to be part of that mission. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes them a better cultural fit for you as a business as well. So that makes, you know, that makes a lot of, lot of sense. Um, as we've gone through these disruptions, as we head into the, the next disruptions, you talked, you talked about capital requirements. Um, and you talked about the, the kind of businesses that you think will survive and thrive and flourish through through those times. Are there specific lessons you you learned through the through the previous disruptions that have kind of 
you know, made you think, yeah, we, you know, we had to do that to get through the pandemic, but that's actually a really good policy, or we've made a particular change, and um, and that set us on a good direction. Are there things you can call out specifically on that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of key things. Microboards always had a real strong stance, and one is automation. Uh, you know, now with the workforce being more difficult and and the rising costs, uh, the the force and the ability to have automation has become more critical. Um, and not to replace jobs, not to replace people, but to be able to pay our people more money um, mm -hmm. while we put automation alongside of them, like inventory towers or cobots or you know, robotic placements for, for uh, parts. So that um, we embraced many years ago, but it's becoming more critical in, in this type of environment. Um, the second thing is really the strength of a company's liquidity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and leverage on a balance sheet is fine, you know, as long as the company has uh, adequate liquidity to weather, you know, the ups and downs of the inventory positions they may need to carry, the downside of maybe a customer that's a large part of their portfolio that, you know, may need some relief. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think uh, EMS companies, if one of the most important roles we have is the financial stability of mm -hmm. our companies, um, given that our customers, um, you know, are obviously a lifeline to the turning of cash so we can bring in as much inventory. So a, a really sharp CFO, a really sharp financial person that has um, that liquidity available, even above and beyond um, what they think they need, uh, I think is really been an absolute necessity in this mm. disruptive environment yeah and when you look at it proportionally and you look at your your numbers on a on a quarterly or, or on, on whatever basis you're looking at them how big a change in the in the capital required within the business have you seen just in the last say 12 months yeah so i think we normally would um have very minimal liquidity requirements partly because back to that culture uh, credit, uh, mm. we require all of our customers to pay in net 30. Um, mm. And the reason we do that is tough. It's tough with some of the larger military customers who are not used to that. Um, it is part of doing business with us. Um, and the reason we do that is we have always treated our suppliers like gold. Uh, and, and that's even more important in this environment. I, you know, we pay our suppliers on time. We don't use them as a bank. Uh, so given that we've been waiting for the golden screw on, you know, a number of kits now for over a year where we can only ship partials, we've, you know, more than doubled our liquidity needs. Um, but we've got a tremendous banking relationship that allowed us to have plenty of room on a working capital line. Um, yeah. and of course, as the, as the inventory is growing, we've got the availability. Um, so yeah. I've never had one amount of concern on uh, liquidity here. Yeah, you know, we've always been overcapitalized. Yeah, and that gives you the ability to maintain your focus, maintain your strategy as you go forward. Finally, Nicole, where do you see things going forward? Is is your? It, it seems that everything you do in your business is planned and considered, um, and planned and considered is great position to be in at the moment because it does feel that we're on a roller coaster ride so to you know to be able to have that stability do you see kind of steady growth maintaining that relatively low number of customers building those even stronger partnerships is that is that how you see the business going forward over the coming months and years yeah, so we do have a strategic plan. We are uh, very focused on growing our medical sector. Um, mm -hmm. There is the opportunity. We, we did hear some recent metrics of distress in the EMS industry because of liquidity and, and things. And if we had the opportunity to, uh, to pick up you know, a distressed EMS company that particularly had strong engineers and a foothold in medical, I think we would do that. Um, mm -hmm. there's, we've got enough capacity here right now that we don't need to do that. Um, but because we're owner operator uh, with me here uh, at the helm, I and I enjoy uh, kind of working companies out. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that would be a real feasible option in the next two to three years. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, we have our strongest backlog, you know, which I most EMS companies do because customers have gone out on their backlog to end of 23, even into 2024. 
Um, so we're very bullish on what's ahead of us. And I think it's, it's going to be up to us to you know, figure out how to execute to these supply chain issues and then yeah. uh, what one or two new customers we want to launch in the next year. Yeah, and having the liquidity and talent to do that. And I think it's interesting what you say about the um, potential acquisition side. I think we're going from a point where it was a seller's market and uh, a lot of EMS businesses were overpriced this year. Um, the multiples were quite surprising on some of the deals that went through. Um, and potentially that will, will change in the latter part of this year and the early part of 2023. So I think there might be some... Um, some interesting opportunities and there are some great businesses out there that with um, with the right strategy and again with the right liquidity could uh, could really shine so uh, exciting times ahead I think challenging but exciting yes absolutely we're very excited and we're really excited about technology and just where it's mm. going and you know we're for us uh, I've had the ability to be briefed by some of the top officials in DC and understanding what the technological warfighter is going to look like in the next yeah. decade um, and yeah. that's really our sweet spot so uh, we're very uh, bullish like I said on um, not just the industrial products the telecom products for the cloud and 5g but really what our military is going to be able to do yeah yeah and the whole technology thing's fascinating from both sides because it, it's exciting in terms of what your customers are bringing to you in, in in terms of what they're asking you to manufacture but it's also exciting in terms of the technology that's coming at you from a manufacturing point of view the automation that's available to you the technology in terms of traceability in terms of performance in terms of building um, even more miniaturization, even better quality than, um, than, than is currently available. So, yeah, I think, you know, technology keeps you excited and the business as well. And obviously the philanthropic work that you're doing um, within the organization as a backbone that you've been doing for some time just kind of makes the whole thing feel, feel like you're doing the right thing. Yeah, I love coming to work every day. Yeah, so That's by great. being able to build the most advanced things in the world while helping those least fortunate is a pretty cool reason to jump out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, 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 it would put a smile on your face every day. Nicole, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you and um, continued success and looking forward to talking again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. <laughs>